Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show this Wednesday, the 29th of December, 2021. Thank you for tuning in. I'm glad to have you guys here. Now, what I want to get at and what I want to talk about today is, is uh, what's going on with the food supplies in the world and also these trucks, you know. Uh, there's an additive that they need to run the trucks on the highway just to get the food to your supermarket. Let's get started. Let's open up the charts right here. Uh, there's a statement from a farmer. He says, not only will be we be able to grow, uh, not only will we not be able to grow cattle, and we will not be able to grow food, and we will not be able to grow grain or anything like that, but even if we could, we can't move it because we can't turn a wheel in a truck because we have no AdBlue. AdBlue is needed for diesel fuels. Half of all the trucks in Australian roads run on diesel. So he's talking about Australia, but this, this applies not just to Australia. This applies to the whole world, you know. There's a problem with, uh, with, with fertilizer in the world. And pr the production of fertilizer in the world. He says, as of February, we might not have any trucks on the road in Australia. We might not have a train on the tracks. So quite literally, the whole country comes to a standstill as of February. Uh, the farmer then goes, goes on to say, go and have a look in your cupboard and go and have a look in your fridge. And I guarantee that just about every single item in there at some point, uh, urea has been used in the production of that item, whether it's a steak or a salad or a can of baked beans. In Europe, we have a full-blown energy crisis unfolding there, made worse by increasingly more destructive policies. Okay, so we, we got big problems in the world. Let's take a look at what's going on here in China. China hoards over half, over half, of the world's grains, pushing up global prices. Testy ties with the United States and Australia could be prodding China to boost its food reserves. Less than 20% of the world's population has managed to stockpile more than half of the global global's supply of maize and other grains, leading to steep price increases across the planet and dropping more countries into famine. The hoarding is taking place. It's happening right now, guys. World food supplies are in jeopardy. Uh, we've come through two years of a massive pandemic around the world. Uh, the world leaders are actually frightened of this, this disease. And, you know, on the surface, this disease seems to be somewhat innocuous uh, to, the, to, to some people out there. You know, they think... But when we take a closer look at it and how quick it mutates in the different versions of itself, and it, 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 we are in a battle against this thing. We don't know what the next mutation is going to be. Now, this mutation didn't seem to be quite as virulent, this last one, but we're in a battle against this. It's a terrible foe, and... Uh, because it mutates so quickly in, into different versions of itself. And at the same time, the world is having these, these problems it's going through, massive problems with, with weather being off in certain places, so farmers are having problems. And, and you also got supply chain issues out there. Uh, it could all lead to massive food insecurity. Even over here in the places where we've been used to always being able to go in the grocery store and it's always fully stocked for us, you know. We might actually start to see food prices just absolutely skyrocket. And this is one one of your expenses that through life it's always been one of your minimal more minimal expenses in your life, you know. I mean, you know, you're you're you've got your rent, you got to pay your all your other bills, and then food comes in there and it's not that big a deal, but when food prices double and triple and quadruple, then all of a sudden it does become a big deal to everybody out there. I mean, everybody, okay, the rich people, ah, it's never going to be a big deal to them. Food. They got billions of dollars. 
But I'm talk not talking about the rich people. I'm talking about the average working people like us. Food has been a certain percentage of our income. When food moves up and it doubles and triples and quadruples, then it becomes a much bigger chunk of our income. So basically, it's like this. We are all basically slaves to the system. We work so that we can eat and have a roof over our heads. This is basically, we're a slave. If you were to go out to a man and tell him, okay, I, I got a job for you. Uh, I'm going to supply you with a car, I'm going to supply you with a house, and I'm going to supply you with your food. But you're going to work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week for me, and I'm not going to pay you anything. I'm just going to provide the basic necessities of life. The guy would say, that sounds like slavery. Yeah, it is. You're a slave. Because you're all, you're never getting ahead. All you're doing is working. Uh, you remember there used to be an old song. Uh, I can't remember how it went. Uh, oh, my soul to the company store. Uh, that, that's That was the words of the song, you know. But it was like you just work every day, hard all day long, and you never, you're never going to get ahead. You're just, the system has us all trapped in this. We're all actually debt slaves to the system. But it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get so we're not going to have the roof over our head anymore. So we're going to be working all day, and we're not, we're just going to have enough money for food, barely. And we're going to be going backwards. Where are you going to sleep? Then at that point, what electricity are you going to have? How are you going to pay your phone bill? How are you going to pay your light bill? How are you going to, because the food bill is going to take all of it. Well, you know, this is unsustainable. This is not a place where you want to go. This is an unsustainable environment that they're creating for us. Uh, anyway. Let's move on here and let's take a look at silver today. Silver is 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 it's right now it's had a dipsy doodle down. Now it's dipsy doodling back up a little bit. You notice when the smash always comes, you know, <laughs> you know, and 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 the comex time of the day, you know, that's always where the manipulation occurs. The silver will be going along in a straight line, pretty much not doing anything, and then all of a sudden it comes to the New York New New York period right here on the chart, and that's when we see all the volatility. Anyway, uh, let's take a look now at uh, 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 at gold. See what gold's doing today. Well, that ain't my gold chart. Live charts, gold. This should be it right here. Eighteen oh four, eighteen oh three ten. It's down three dollars and ten cents on the day. It's making its way back up again. Let's take a look at cryptocurrencies. We're looking at two trillion two hundred and thirty-three billion. Uh, let me refresh the page and see which way this is going right now. Uh, two two four six. So it's going up a little bit right now. It's at forty-seven thousand nine hundred and thirty-three. Let's take a look at the Dow Jones and see what it's doing. It's very close. I think it's very, very close right now. All these markets started to make an all-time highs. Uh, here's the thing, guys. The Fed hasn't stopped. They're still pumping money into the system really big time right now. But they're getting ready to slam their foot on the brake pedal. But it hasn't happened yet. And so we see these markets still drifting upwards. The markets... I think are in a state of somewhat disbelief right now at this point. Like, oh, the Fed will never do this stuff, you know. They're not going to ever cut back putting the money in there. Well, the Fed's going to try to cut back, and they are. When they really get started at these cutbacks, they start to dig in deep in the next couple months. And I think we're going to see a different story going on here. You know, and it... What interests me a lot is it's the timing of all this. It's going to come the same time that Evergrande and these other property development companies in China go... <laughs> it's going to come at the same time as these cuts really start to hit. Looking out into January and February. Okay? Here's the thing, guys. Is over in China, what China's doing right now is... They're basically telling the West, 
Oh, about your money, you know, all those billions and bonds and everything else. You can just go out and whistle. <laughs> you know? Uh, and normally how it works is, is, is if a big company like that, you know, doesn't pay off their payments on the money they owe, right? They give them a certain amount of time. And then they come into for and then they foreclose on the company and they shut the company down. This is how it works in the West, right? And then they put their assets go into receivership. That's normally how it works in the West. But you know, Evergrande is up and running right now. The Chinese government are working in there. Chinese government tell them you guys get working and you keep working, and this company's open and it stays open, and you guys are all going to build these homes. How is the West going to go in there and foreclose on them? They can't. They can't foreclose on them. They're in China. They're protected. So how are they going to... They can't go through normal due process of taking the company and putting it into foreclosure and for, for foreclosing on everything and, and receivership and all that kind of gook. They can't do any of that stuff. The company's over there and they're like... They're like thumbing their nose up. They're like, ha ha, you can't touch us. And we're going to continue to run. And you guys you lent us all that money? Oh, well, too bad. Whistle. That's what's going on. So now all of a sudden, that's they're going to start to forestall this. These companies don't have their money now. These banks and stuff. Evergrande's not paying. They're going to try to forestall it as long as they can and make it look like Evergrande's eventually going to pay. Because the second that they go and they say, this is for real, Evergrande's never paying us back, then all of a sudden they got a giant hole in their books. So they're going to do whatever they can do, whatever maneuvers that they can figure to maneuver to try to get out of that so they don't have that giant hole in their books. Hundreds of billions of dollars. Giant hole. This is an enormous hole. And it's going to be in these banks' books, which is going to have collateral damage through the banking system of the West. Cannot go any other way. So what they're going to do is now they're going to drag their heels and forestall it and try to make it legally seem like Evergrande is still a viable whatever. When that money's really gone, but they can't face that hole, that gaping hole that's there. So that's this is all coming. This is all coming due. It's all coming due at the same point that that's really these cuts are going to come in and that the Fed's doing. All going to come at the same time in January and February probably, and so we're going to see some some really big action. It's not going to be action to the upside in all these markets. Let me tell you. Uh, then what's going to happen? Well, at a certain point, you know, it's going to, I've forecast this for years. If you guys watching my channel, I forecast this. I call it the deflationary spike event. I can go back three years ago and show you shows that I've done on this. I've been forecasting it coming. The thing is, is my forecasting, one of the problems I have is getting the timing right. Well, who doesn't? But I see it coming. I also see something else coming I'm going to tell you guys about this morning. Food wars. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that on this particular show. But the fight for food production. And what does that tell you? What I think is coming. Uh, this world could get really, really nasty, really, really fast. And, it, and a lot more nasty than it's been through the, the virus pandemic. Uh, it seemed like when we went into the 2020s, we went into a, a horrible place. <laughs> we went into the cavernous section, you know, and, and when are we going to come out of it? I believe we are going to come out of it into a, into a much better than what we're fighting through right now. This is rough. Anyway, listen, guys, let's move on here and take a look now at the oil price today at 7706. 
it's up a dollar eight from the day or 1.42 percent so oil is getting toasty warm here uh, move index today is at 77.52 and it's been declining lately slowly declining that's because they're being tight with money and so credit is stabilizing it's as simple as that let's take a look now at bonds and rates and we see these bond yields starting to move now, now this is moves that I expected told you guys a few shows ago and I'm gonna repeat it watch that 10 year right here I'm gonna see if I can highlight it for you guys whoops a 10 year watch that 10 year right now it's at 1.54 percent and it's up 6.5 basis points today alone told you guys this is gonna to start to creep up I also told you guys the mark it's at 1.54 right now when it gets to 1.75 then we're ready then it's primed and it's ready things are ready to start to fall and we get to 1.75 so we're watching it we're up six point we're up over six basis points today we're looking at a US 10 year today at 1.548 and we're looking at a US 30 year at 1.968 so the 30 years getting almost ready to go over two percent and this is the reason why these are gonna creep up is because the Fed's the biggest purchaser and in order to keep bond yields low they have to continue to purchase bonds to keep yields low. When they stop purchasing bonds, the Fed, and they hollow this market, the yields are going to creep up higher because the market's lost its biggest buyer. And when that happens is the markets can only cannot withstand high yields because what happens is 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 as bond yields go up higher and higher, you know, we, we've also got the rate of inflation that figures into this. See, when these bond yields are the, at these record lows, like they are right now, they're not figuring in the rate of inflation. So if you purchase a bond yield for 10 years there, 10 year, and you only get 1.55%, well, you got to understand that the rate of inflation is over 6%. So it's a losing deal. So who's been buying this? Because this is a losing proposition. Well, the Fed's the buyer. But in order for bond yields on a 10-year to get up to a rate where you can actually make money on it, you'd have to have 10 or 15%. Ah, it's a mess. It's a total mess. Everything's distorted, see? And the problem is, is if have the distortions go back to normal again, it would break the whole system completely apart. So they can't let it go back to normal. They have to keep it distorted at this point. And the distortions are going to get worse. Eventually, I think we're going to see negative yields. We're not even going to see a yield on these bonds eventually. Yeah, bond yields are going to creep up, okay? But they're going to come back in there stronger than ever. In fact, in the end, they'll probably have to do something called yield curve control to keep yields down. Okay, uh, where are we? We're going to take a look at the dollar here. 95.89 today, and it's dropping. Thank you guys for listening to my show. You guys have a great afternoon. Like and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys in the very next episode. Bye-bye.